Have you got that picture of that baby calf standing by that tire? All right, there's a couple of pictures I sent. Oh, ain't he just as worthless as anything? You, look at this. Now, look, I want to explain this picture a minute. This is a two-horsepower, sixty, a two-wheel drive, 60-horsepower international tractor. That's the front tire. It's about this tall. I mean, it's not a big tire. I want you to under, the reason I got this one is because I want you to see just how. Oh, my gosh, worthless that calf is. Okay. Uh, does anybody want him? He'd be 75, 80, 75 now, 80, 85. He'd be 90, 95. He'd be a... This dude, right, let me just tell y'all wh- wh- why this is a sermon. Because, uh, man, sometimes can you just know that ignorance is blind? Okay? And sometimes you don't know how ignorant you are till you realize what you wasn't seeing. Okay, so I had a set of heifers last year put together, and, and they got about breeding age, and I wanted to sell them, but I never did get around to getting them pinned and getting them to the barn or getting them sold. And so I, I man, these son on just, they, they need a boyfriend, so I just threw a bull in there. I just threw a cheap little old Corrini bull that I bought, because I know Corrini's going to have small calves. I did not know they was going to be that small. Which never was going to be my problem because I was going to let them get bread and I was going to sell them this fall as bread heifers. So I didn't have to, I, I'd just soon have them gone and somebody else get to see them cute little babies and I'd start a whole other project. And anyway, long story short, I just fooled around and I didn't get them and get them sold this fall. So last week I'm feeding and I've moved them back to the house now and I'm feeding and I see the steam coming off this fresh pile of cow manure and I thought, boy, this old feed's rich. I mean, that's a big old, pretty good-sized pile, but this good feed I'm mixing up here. And then all of a sudden, the, that cow pile picked up its head. <laughs> and I thought, it looked better as a pile. Because <laughs> there's nothing there. Nothing. This is, these are, this is the smallest dead gum. Well, I ain't, this, is, this is a true story. That same day, uh, Doug calls me and says, hey, I got two heifers I'd like to breed them. Do you got a bull I can breed them to? I just died laughing. <laughs> and I had a decision to make because I have, listen to me, I have a low birth weight, no problem bull. He will, you, you, you got a goat when it hits the ground, but you will have no trouble with it getting here. You got nothing when it comes. Now, I want you all to think about this. That is over a year I've had these heifers, and I still got nothing because... I mean, oh, yeah, I, 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 listen, I hope you are upset with me, and it motivates you to want these animals, because I'll bring them to you. Because, I mean, you're just, I mean, it's like, how long has that calf been so tiny, though? Ever since conception. It was little bitty in the beginning. It never got bigger than little bitty. It was little bitty. Guess what? When it's two years old, it'll still be little bitty. Y'all, ain't there a country song about little bitty? It's all right to be little. That's not true. That's not, that's not profitable to be little bitty. So anyway, I told Doug, I said, Doug, look here, bud. I got a, I got a bull. I can promise you, you ain't got to worry about him having a calf. Because, I, I mean, I knew we were close, but, I mean, it's two of them now. I got two of them standing. There, and one of them actually probably outweighs the other one by two and a half, two and three-quarter pounds. So I'm like. But I would not, don't, no, I would not tell you to breed to this bull. Why? I said, because I can promise you, we're friends right now. When that heifer has that baby, you will not like me because you will be stuck with a calf that you just, there's just not a lot of future in you. Uh, and I wanted to share, and this led me to my verse, uh, Matthew 15, verse 14. It says, so... Jesus told them, ignore them. The blind guide's leading the blind. And if a blind, guide, a blind person guides another, they both fall into the ditch. And the truth is, if we're blind and we're following blind leadership, we will both end up in the ditch. And so I want to talk a little bit about being blind and, and following blind leaders. I want to share how I told Doug... Uh, don't bring me them heifers and put them with this bull. I sold that bull the next, I mean, he had a baby. The first, first offspring he produced got his head cut off. Because I wouldn't even let nobody else buy him. I sold him as a Packer bull. He, he needs to go hang. Because he's, he's, I mean, I, 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 I don't like him. And he, I own him, so I could do that. And if y'all don't like that, y'all don't need to eat no fajitas for today. Chicken only for you people that think I'm cruel. 
I, I just like, man, no, this someone's got to get. Every time I see his offspring, I am ticked off. You hear me? I wanted them to be little, just not look more like a goat. They wouldn't even make a good-sized dog. I mean, it's like, oh. So anyway, I told Doug, I said, man, don't, we don't want to do that. We don't want to put you in the same bind, the same spot. I'm, I'm in a ditch when it comes to these, this set of heifers. And I don't want to put you in the ditch. Now, you don't want to be bred to no Charlay, big 110-pound birth weight. You want to have a small birth weight. But they got to have a little bit of a future. they got to have a little bit of potential and ability. And what Jesus is teaching, and we're going to get into this, we're going to get into Matthew 15 this week and next week, about being blind and being led by blind. And how we need not to be led by blind leaders. We, 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 we have guides, but we, we can't just walk blindly. And I'm telling you, we better open our eyes. We better pay attention. Uh, I'm going to focus on the two things that Jesus emphasized that I believe we can see indicates or identifies spiritual blindness. Jesus is the one that used them as an example. You follow me? He used two examples we're going to study the next, this week and next that said these guys are so blind and this is how you know they're blind. And I want to make sure we're not blind. I want to make sure I'm not blind. I want to make sure you're not blind. I believe, I believe in a church setting, I believe in our, the way we do church, I have to examine myself before I preach to the church. And, and, and challenge or instruct you guys to, to examine yourself. And so am I blind? Am I blind in how I'm living and studying and following God's word? Am I blind in what's going on around me? Am I leading? Is our leadership in this church leading a body blindly? Because listen, if you lead your body blindly, you'll all, we all end up in a ditch. And I want to, I want to, ditch don't mean hell. Y'all ever ended up in a ditch? What happens when you're driving and you ain't paying attention and you end up in the ditch? What happens? You're stuck. And so what he's saying is if you don't follow with eyesight, if you don't follow people that are seeing and knowing where they're going, can recognize curves and stops and goes, and if it, then when you end up in the ditch, it don't mean you've lost your salvation. It means you've quit progressing. You've quit going down the highway of spirituality, so to speak. And so I want us to make sure we grasp that and, and know that the, the reason we'd have this kind of a sermon is because shame on me if I'm a blind leader, blind, leading blind people, and shame on you if you're just willing to be blind following a blind guy. And, and God's word will enlighten and show us and reveal us what we see and what we don't see. And so I want to make sure we, we see why we had preached this sermon. I also want to make sure you know why I think you never hear this really preached. Have you ever really heard a preacher stand up and preach? You better, you better, you better examine and see is your pastor blind or not. Think about this. I'm telling you, I love you guys, most all of you. And those of y'all that I don't love yet, the Lord has brought you into my life to help me learn what love really is, and I'm thankful for that. But if I'm blind, I not need to lead another day because I will lead us all. This is not a light sermon or, a, or an easy, you know, it can be, it's going to be fun, it's going to be funny, but the biblical truth that we need to see is the importance of spiritual eyesight so that a whole body of believers don't run off the side of the road and end up in a ditch, so that the whole community of Russ County don't run off the road and end up in a ditch or the state of Texas. Or the country. If you just step back and look, I don't think, <laughs> I don't see a whole lot of people seeing very much in our leadership as a nation. The reason this is also a timely sermon is because y'all need to open your eyes and not listen to what politicians tell you, but see what they do. Study voters' guides. Study their past history of how they voted and what they stand for. We elect these people. We put them in office. And it is our responsibility. And when we don't fulfill our responsibility, we are be, we're blind and we're being led by blind people. 
And, I, and just so I can clear the air and tick half of you off, when you, those of you that say, well, I just got one vote, it won't matter anyway. That's blind and ignorant. It's the only voice we have. It is the most powerful. It's not a right. It is a responsibility. So go to the polls and vote with your biblical moral co- Vote with your spiritual eyes. Do you know, I bet you, if we took a poll, the majority of proclaiming Christians that do vote don't pray and fast or seek God before they even vote. They surf YouTube or Facebook or listen to TV and com- radio and what's that other idiot box ads and make their decisions. So I'm just telling you, we got to have spiritual eyes. I've already got two text messages. Anybody want to guess what they're for? <laughs> oh, I know, I know. You don't come to church to hear about politics. It's about the separation of church and state. Well, if we keep that up, you'll sure enjoy that life. Because we've about near got the church plum put out of all our structures and fundamental uh, functions of a nation and and you definitely don't need me to be your preacher because I believe we should be the most active, most influential body in our country. So, let's get back to the sermon. My bad. Spiritually speaking, Jesus is warning. In fact, he's actually telling his disciples, do not follow these blind guys. Do not. How many of y'all have raised kids and you've told your kids, do not run with such and such. They're not the right crowd. Do not hang out with such and such. I know that you're getting, I know y'all are this, but don't run with that. That's going to get you in trouble. And do they listen? No. So chances are y'all won't listen to the word when Jesus says, don't just follow along with blind guides. So when you're stuck in the ditch of life and nothing's working right and you can't, I don't think God's listening to me. I don't feel nothing. I'm I'm so, I'm just going to flip to this verse right here. Who you been following? Who you been following? Or when it's your child that is in the ditch and don't know which direction is the right way to go. Stuck, can't move, ain't move. And you're like, I don't know what's wrong with them. Well, they followed you. So I want us to to examine ourselves, me first. Do we have spiritual eyesight? How do we know? Jesus showed us two ways how to know. Matthew 15, we're going to study one of them today and one of them next week. Matthew 15, 1 through 2, I'm reading the message version. It says, after that, the Pharisees and religious scholars came to Jesus all the way from Jerusalem, criticizing, why do your disciples play fast and loose with the rules? They're, they come to him from Jerusalem uh, to, to where Jesus was teaching and instructing. And, and they, they traveled to interview Jesus. They traveled to get to the bottom of this. And then they're like, first question out of their mouth. Why is it your disciples don't wash their hands before they eat? This is bothering me. They're like, we can't do it. This is, this is a basic. Everybody, every Jew has to go through the cleansing, washing of their hands before they are allowed to eat. They must, but, but, but yours ain't. This is not right. Why are, they, uh, why are they disregarding? And when it says what the message translated is with the rules, actually was the traditions of our elders. Why is it that your disciples ain't doing and following the traditions of our elders? I, I wanted to show you in Mark the same. Uh, Mark wrote a little more detail about what they were talking about. It's in Mark chapter 7. 1 through 5 says, The Pharisees, along with some of the religious scholars who had come from Jerusalem, gathered around him. They noticed that some of his disciples weren't being careful with the ritual of washing before meals. The Pharisees, uh, Jews in general, in fact, would never eat a meal without going through the motions of a ritual hand washing with a special vigorous scrubbing if they had been out in the market or in public to say nothing of the scourings they had to give jugs and pots and pans. And so they were, this was, a, they, they were, uh, what, what, what's that people get diagnosed with? They just, OCD-ish. I mean, they just, this, had, this was just, it had to be done. And it's just, in fact, there's, there's writings that talks about how the Pharisees seen, if you didn't wash your hands, you were as filthy as if you had been with a prostitute. 
They literally took it that serious, this cleansing and washing of your hands before you eat a meal. It goes on to say there, the, uh, says, uh, showing up at meals without washing their hands. So I want you to see what their priority is, or what their questioning is, a tradition that was handed down to them by the elders of their people. These elders are dead and gone. They're not there no more, but they've done it for however many years. And so the religious leaders, the authorities, are like, you can't stop that. Today, if you go to Israel today, you will see in restaurants to the side somewhere a sink with a basin of water so that they can do a ceremonial cleansing today. And so it's still a part of their life. It's still a part of uh, very much important to them. Verse 3 through 9 in Matthew 15, Jesus put it right back on them. Why do you use your rules to play fast and loose with God's command? God clearly says, respect your fathers and your mothers, and anyone denouncing father or mother should be killed. But you weasel around that saying, whoever wants to can say to father or mother, what I owed to you, I've given to God. Now, y'all need to grab that. Jesus is talking, and he tells the Pharisees, why have y'all made this such a rule? And why, why are you uh, playing so loose with God's commands? Now, what command is Jesus referencing? Honor your father and mother, uh, Exodus chapter 20, verse 12. Honor your father and your mother, then you will live a long and full life in the land that your God will, is giving to you. It is the only, it's the first command that has a benefit attached to it. Honor your father and mother, and you will. And it, it's the, I mean, it's the, it's the first command. The commandments are really kind of in two groups. Your relationship to God and your relationship to fellow man. That is the first command when it has the references dealing with fellow man. That's important to grasp, okay? Just hold on to those two little old nuggets. Jesus said, you don't follow the commandment of honoring your father and mother. The first commandment that is directly in relationship to this realm, how we deal with people, all right? He said, but then he continues by saying, what I owed to you, I've given to God. Have y'all ever thought about that commandment have anything to do with what you owe your parents? No, you ain't. You thought it meant honor your mother and father. You may be thankful to them, be respectful of them, be polite to them, send them a Christmas card and a picture of the babies when they're born. Uh, I'm not going to talk bad about them. I'm not going to tell them they cray, cray, cray. I'm not going to. No, you're going to honor them with, I love you too, mother. That's not, that, that, that's a portion of honoring. The, the part Jesus is talking about is you don't pay them back what you owe them. If you don't pay your parents back what you owe them, then you're dishonoring them. So, time out, Jesus. What do I owe my parents? Well, what do you owe your parents? Well, the first thing you owe them is a clean butt. Because they're the ones that give it to you for the first two years of your life. Right? Second thing you owe them, milk, green peas, spinach, broccoli, you know what I'm saying? How about health care? Who wiped up your puke when you was five years old? Who doctored you with, for chicken pox even though they could still get chicken pox? Your parents, I didn't do it. Your preacher didn't do it. He didn't call no preacher. I done threw up, and I got, I got it coming out both ends. Jesus, send me the preacher. That ain't who you asked for. <laughs> right? You be, wanting to, you be wanting your mama. Oh, my mama, my daddy. Who'd you call when you was in the middle of the dark and the vine broke down the side of the road? You don't want to call my daddy. Are you following me? What do you owe your parents? You owe them Everything they invested to you in the beginning of your life when you had nothing to invest. Do you, do you pay them back? Here's what they had done. The religious rulers had created this new law. Listen, they, the Israelites knew this. The, 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 they knew this is what honoring your mother and father meant. I want you to know it ain't changed. God's word's the same yesterday, today, and forever. God's commands are still God's commands. Now, Thank you, Lord Jesus came, and he fulfilled every command. How do we know he fulfilled his, all his commands? Because he was given life on this earth by his Father. My Father sent me, and when it come time for him to choose what he would do with what his Father gave him, what did he do? He gave his life right back. Basically, what you owe your parents is your life. 
And so ask yourself, am I really honoring my parents? Jesus said, here's what the religious rulers did in the day. What they did was <clears throat> they figured out a way to benefit and give people an out. If you tell your parents what I owed you, I have dedicated to God through the Pharisees and the structures of the temple. Therefore, I no longer owe you. Good luck. Well, how many of y'all have been irritated so much with your parents that you'd be optioning that out just real quick? If you're honest, every one of, I can guarantee you my kids get so sick of me that they'd be punching that button before they ever got out of high school. I mean, we all get irritated with our people. There's nobody can irritate you like your family, especially the mama that won't shut up and mind her own business. Or the daddy that's got a little fat pocket and he wants to control everything. Let me mash on you a little bit, make you a better man. I need to go back to honor and hold on a minute. I flipped on me. <laughs> so they created, now listen, they created a way to benefit by altering God's commands. You want to know if you got a blind pastor, does he personally benefit by altering God's word? You want to know if you should listen to a teaching, someone teach, do they alter anything of the word or do they adjust it or if they're really good with their tongue and able to talk real smooth, do they influence by their wording a way that their personal gain takes precedence over God's command? If you, if, if you, if you are, then that, that sucker's blind, and he's manipulated God's word. The first way you know somebody is a blind leader is if they are altering God's word for their gain. Somebody jump up and say, I heard that preached last week. I, I'm going to keep digging because this is real stuff. I do not want us to be blind people because if we're willing to be blind in our church family, we will sure enough be blind in our country. And if we refuse to be blind in and of ourselves, then we will not allow anybody to treat us as if we were blind. Are y'all following me? I mean, if you're blind in this house, you won't have enough confidence to walk with sight outside of this house. So my job, my duty, my, my goal, my purpose is to help us find confidence in our sight, our spiritual sight, and no, I am not blind. I am following Jesus. you the blind idiot. I ain't following you. Whether it's political, financial, economical, marital, you may have been married to a blind spouse. I didn't tell you to leave the blind spouse. I'm telling you quit following the blind spouse. And tell them, you go follow me because I'm tired of getting in your ditch. You can't leave them. You're stuck with them. But you ain't got to be stuck in the ditch. They could be stuck on the road. Anybody ever been married to her? Him, 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 him. <laughs> That's what the Lord's saying. He said, you have created a way around God's rule. And you're no longer honoring your mother and your father. You're no longer paying them what you owe them. Do you know I've been in situations with elderly people, and I'm praying with a family, and there's decisions that have to be made. And one of the number one contributing factors what makes those decisions is how much is Medicare picking up. <laughs> that is heartbreaking. And it's, them that it's, it's usually the older person that says, because they don't want to be a hindrance or a burden. And it's not, you can't allow that to be, that's a blessing. That is an honor for you to carry the weight of your grandparents and your parents. It is a privilege for you to provide for them what they're no longer able to provide for themselves. And if you don't do that, you ain't honoring them. And that's why our country's wrecking out, because we don't understand honor in our own families anymore. The family is the structure that God designed and gave us in the beginning, the family. And the reason he told us to honor our parents, the first relationship he addressed, the first relationship on this earth, he said, you do this, and you'll be blessed with this. 
The reason is because if you can't honor your parents, who can you honor? If you can't care for the ones that cared for you, who can you care for? <laughs> I know, I know, guys. Listen, I know some of y'all are sitting here saying you don't know my parents. We're going to talk about this next Wednesday, this coming Wednesday, because I want you to understand, I'm, if your parents abused you and neglected you and they didn't feed you, then I am not, ta- I am not talking about two donors that contributed two and a half minutes to the conception of your life. I'm talking about people that nurtured you and fed you and clothed you and parented you. So don't fall into that trap where you don't know my parents. I can't honor. You can honor whoever it was that came into your life and met your needs. And if you don't have them, if you don't even know who they are, you can honor somebody that ain't got nobody because you didn't have nobody when somebody gave you. You following me? So we got to break this cycle. And I'm telling you, the, the dead gum cycle we're in is a, 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 I can't think of the word. It won't come to me. Uh, I blame millennials for having this all the time. And, and you owe me, Jace London. You owe me just because I got on a good-looking pink shirt. <laughs> and you, uh, you owe, you, uh, thank you very much, entitlement. Man, <laughs> this country can't function on entitlement, people. Because it was built on responsibilities. And it is our responsibility to honor our parents. And that does yes mean saying yes sir and no sir. By the way, if you're this tall and you live in a parent's home, yes sir and no sir ought to come out your mouth. It, it also is being where they told you to be on Friday night. It also is living like they told you to live. But we got to require honoring. We got to demand honor. We got to live a life as parents that's honorable. And Jesus said, You can find who's blind if you just want to see them because they don't honor their parents. And listen, you can't be spiritually enlightened with sight if you don't understand honoring because honoring is the currency of the kingdom. If you want God to move, be honoring. If you want a better job, honor God in the job you got. If you want a better wife, honor God with the wife that's breathing, that's right there with you. She may not be all that pretty. She may not can cook, but if you'll honor her, she may learn something. 